How to Study the Bible, part two. Part two. Um, and so I'm very, very excited to continue our study of the Bible. Our study of the Bible. How many know that it's incredibly important that we not only read the Bible, but we study the Bible? There's a difference between simply reading the Bible and studying the Bible. When we read the Bible, we simply read through the text and we get informed with the story of Scripture. But when we study the Bible, we take our time to dig in. Remember I told you there's a difference between um, raking and digging? Let's get the, the house lights on so uh, our beautiful people can take notes. And uh, there we go. And then there was light. Amen. Now, when we read the Bible, we're raking. We're raking. We're, we're being informed by the, the story of Scripture as we go through different texts. We, we rake. Many of our even devotional times are, are raking. We just read the Bible. We simply get informed with the text and whatever, whatever portion we're reading. But when we study the Bible, that's when we're doing the digging. And how many know when you dig, that's when you get to the gold? That's when you get to the, to the treasure. And so it's incredibly important for us to, to study the Bible. You know, uh, we received a comment from, from an individual and, um, and they said, they, when, they, when they saw that we were doing a, a series on how to study the Bible, uh, they had sent the church a message basically saying something, something to the effect of, uh, well, it's not very complicated. Um, <laughs> just, uh, just read the Bible ask the Holy Spirit for help, and that's, that's all there is to it. And uh, though I'm sure there were good intentions, but I talked about the danger of isolating ourselves with the Bible. Remember that? And where we go in Scripture, whether it's in the times of Jesus or in the times of the early church, Scripture is experienced in community. They went to the synagogue and Scripture was read. Right? Even in the early church, they sat at the apostles' feet under the teaching of the apostles. It was collective. When the New Testament letters were written, they were circulated amongst churches to be read collectively as a community. And so it wasn't an isolated um, experience with you and scripture, though we, we have those moments, we have those experiences where we have devotional time with God, we have study time with God, but the, 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 the overarching experience with scripture that we see in the Bible is that it is experienced in community. It is experienced in the gathering. That's the church. And so it's incredibly important for us to do that. Otherwise, we will become arrogant. How many know knowledge puffs up? And so what you had, what you can have and develop then is a religious spirit, a spirit of arrogance that, that says things like, well, it's just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus. And, and in my experience, anytime someone utters the phrase, it's just me and Jesus, the Jesus they're talking about differs from the Jesus of the Bible. Because that is a Jesus that is shaped by their isolated experience. It's, it's a Jesus shaped by their biases and their filters. Remember we talked about biases and filters last week? We all have them. And so anytime you hear somebody say, well, it's just me and Jesus, that is dangerous language, my friends. It's dangerous language. For the Bible says it is good for us to gather. And so it's important for us to do that as we study as we study scripture. Remember last week I showed you a text found in John 5, 39. These are the words of Jesus. He says to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. And so, so who is this about? It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's not about us. It's about him. The only way we can find eternal life in the word of God is when we encounter the God of the word. Because Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know the one you have sent. You see that? And so, and so reading this book, it's, it's not, 
this mystical thing that, that you know, some people have tried to experience it mystically and, and spiritually, and, and they have not known the God of the Bible, and so they have not experienced what the Bible calls new birth, what the Bible calls uh, 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 entering into the kingdom of God. That can only happen when we encounter Jesus in the word. And so John very strategically writes his gospel and starts it off with the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Fast forward to verse 14. And the word became flesh. Interesting. Interesting. So, so it's imp incredibly important that we understand that scripture is about him. We read the Bible to encounter God. That's why we read the Bible. We read scripture to encounter him. And so it's incredibly important that we understand these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says scriptures are there so that they can bear witness about me. Now, another question we got to ask today is, is who controls the meaning of the text? Who controls the meaning of the text. Remember I told you to stay away from Bible studies where the first question that they propose and they uh, ask is, so what does this mean to you? Now, how many know that's an important question? It's a relevant question because it is, it is the way we connect the, the um, contextual setting of the text and we bring it to contemporary significance of today. And so we need to ask the question of application. We need to ask the question of how does this that I have just read, which we talked about when, you know, when we read scripture, it's a cross-cultural experience. Thousands of years ago, different people, different setting, different mindset. And so we have to understand that it's a cross-cultural experience. And the, so the question of, well, how does this fit into my life? Incredibly important. But before we get there, we need to ask, well, what does this originally mean? So who controls the meaning? Well, it's the, original, it's the original author, isn't it? And so, and so the text has an author. The text also has, has an audience. Now, where you and I um, have the benefit is that the Bible says that all of Scripture is breathed by God. It is Holy Spirit inspired. And so it's his material that we're reading. And the... And the advantage you and I have as believers is we have the instructor within us. For when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus says, he will remind you and he will lead you into all truth. And so we are reading his material and he, the Holy Spirit, the instructor is inside of us. And so we need to avail ourselves to him. And so he controls the original meaning. There's, there's a scripture... In, in, uh, in Matthew, that, that Jesus is giving this parable and he starts off with this, this parable of, um, this parable that he gives or the story that he gives and he starts the this, this story off with, um, in those days, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord. But, but I will say, I never knew you. They'll say, Lord, didn't we do these miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? But I will say to you, I never knew you. He expounds on that text by saying that you never did the will of my father who is in heaven. And then he gives the story of a wise man and a foolish man, a wise builder and a foolish builder. You remember the story? He says this, those who hear my words and do them are like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. But those who hear my words and do not do them is like, are like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. The storm comes, the winds come, the waves come, and how many know only one house will remain standing? And that is the house built upon the rock. Now, 
This is incredibly important because we're talking about studying the Bible. Why is it important to study the Bible? Why can't I just go into my room, uh, sit there, and expect to experience everything? Why can't we just give Bibles to people who have no idea of the story of Scripture and expect them to experience something? Because the Bible needs correct interpretation. Hello? If we misinterpret it, if we misinterpret Jesus' words, they are no longer Jesus' words. I'm gonna repeat that. If we misinterpret God's words, they're no longer God's words. Hello? And God is only committed to backing up what he said. Not what you think he said. God is also not committed to backing up what you want him to say. Hello? How many have ever encountered a verse where you go, God, I wish you didn't say it like this. I wish you said it like this. It would have been easier to to abide by. But God is only committed to his word, not our interpretation of it. And so interpreting correctly God's word is incredibly important. So he says, he who hears my words and does them. Now, we focus on the doing part, that's important. But the hearing part is equally important because correct hearing leads to correct doing. Did you hear that? Correct hearing leads to correct doing. But if we don't hear well, we won't do well. If we misinterpret what we're hearing, we're going to have a hard time living it out. And so frustration and stagnation will begin to occur in your life as a follower of Jesus. And you're going to be wondering, why isn't God backing up his word? He is. You're just misinterpreting it. And so that's why studying scripture is incredibly, incredibly important. Rightly hearing the word leads to rightly doing the word. There's a scripture in Luke. I think I I gave it to you, Lou. I I want you to see this. If you can, if you can, I'll read it to you. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, being Jesus, to the test. Don't you love when people put Jesus to the test? Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How many know that's an important question? That's a concerning question, eternal life. I want you to see Jesus' response to him. He, being Jesus, said to him two questions. What is written in the law and how do you read it? I want you to catch that. Jesus did not simply ask the question, what does the law say? He says, how do you read the law? Hello? In other words, it's not just what God is saying, but what are you hearing God say? What is written in the law and how do you read it? That gives us insight into the reality that we can take something that God has said, misinterpret it, and then no longer experience his commitment to it because it's no longer his word. Hello? Now, if I, if I tell you, for instance, right, just an example, if I say something from up here, like, I love food. I know, great surprise. You're like, oh, no way, shock. But you leave here telling somebody, yeah, Pastor Moses is not really into food. He's just like, whatever's on my plate, I'll eat it. It's no big deal. How many know that's not, those aren't my words? Even though you attached and Pastor Moses said, doesn't mean that's what I said. In the Old Testament, the correct application or interpretation of using the Lord's name in vain actually had to do with prophecy. Did you know that? It wasn't how you and I today will hear, or we'll watch a movie or, or we'll be in the grocery store, or we'll be taking the public transit and somebody will, well, somebody will you know, uh, substitute either the, word, the name Jesus or God substituted as a cuss word and we go well don't don't use the lord's name in vain no no no. the original interpretation and the application of that that command is don't say god said something if he didn't don't use the lord's lord's name in vain 
Correctly interpret what he said. Correct hearing leads to correct doing. And might I suggest that there are many Christians who are frustrated in their doing because they're not hearing correctly. Because they have mismanaged and misinterpreted the word of God. And they have allowed other people to tell them what it says rather than to be disciplined and submissive under the scripture and allow scripture to be the authority over their life. All right, those were just introductory remarks. As you know, they they don't count against the clock. All right? So I don't want to hear nothing about Pastor Moses went over time. I never do. Praise God. Somebody's on my side. Okay. Um, Is that good? Does that make sense? All right. We're doing good so far? All right. Remember last week I talked to you about the interpretive journey? The interpretive journey is how we go from the, the, um, the, the original text, the, the original setting of the text, the contextual setting of the text, and we move towards the, the contemporary significance for today. You remember that? I give you five things to look over. I gave you homework out of Joshua 1. How many did their homework? I want to know. Who's failing my class? Looks like everybody's failing. Looks like everybody's failing my... Either, either I'm a bad teacher or you're a bad student, but I'll let, you, I'll let you decide that one. Okay, so Joshua 1, um, 1 to 9. Let me read it for you because I, want, I do want to break this down. Um, It says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel, every place that your soul of foot will tread upon, I will, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great rivers, uh, the river Euphrates. All the land, let's keep moving, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward going, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you shall have good success wherever you go. And where are they going? To the promised land. Verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Verse nine, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What an incredible thing for Joshua to hear from God. And so I want to I want to be practical tonight and I want us to walk through the interpretive journey of this text. And so there's five things. The original meaning the contextual setting, as you observe the contextual setting, what you are observing are gaps and differences from then and today. And then you are finding, number three, finding the theological principle, which is the timeless truth in the text, and then relating the principle to the rest of the Bible, because how many know scripture interprets scripture? And so if you somehow pull out a principle, but the rest of the Bible does not agree with it, throw it out. Hello? It has to fit with the rest of the Bible. 
And then you move to the contemporary significance and the application, which is incredibly important. So let me, let me draw this out for you because I want you, to, I want you to see why this is important. Okay, so, so number one, does anyone remember what number one is? All right, we're gonna find out if I'm a bad teacher or if you're a bad student tonight, all right? <laughs> what is number one? Oh, you see it, cheating. All right, now nah, let's keep it up. Let's, let's keep it up. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you guys remembered. All right, let's keep it up. Let's keep it up there for, for everyone, for everyone to, uh, to see. Can you guys see this or is this too small? You guys, all right. So number one is the original meaning, right? That's number one. Now this continues, and then number two, what do you have? Contextual, Contextual setting. And these are the gaps and differences, okay? Now this, we kind of take a little bit of a dip because there's a gap here and there's a difference, okay? Now this continues, but what's number three? The Finding the theological principle. Okay, so if number two is the gap, it's the difference, right? Remember I talked about David and Goliath? And the difference is, we're not David. We're not representing an entire nation. The victory of a nation isn't on our hands, right? So there's gaps. There's, there's contextual differences. And so finding a theological principle allows us to go over the gap. Do you see that? Because it's a theological principle, because it is timeless, and so the text, because the text has a setting, particular time, particular place, the theological principle, number three then, allows us to build a bridge to go over the gap. And so the theological principle out of David and Goliath, remember we talked about this last week, is that God is a covenant-keeping covenant God. That's a timeless truth. That allows us to go over the contextual gap. Okay? That's number three. What's number four? Okay. Number four is how the principle relates to the rest of the Bible. And then number five? Contemporary significance. And then we continue and we allow the original meaning to go in this interpretive journey all the way to contemporary application. You see that? Now, remember I talked to you about the importance of this. If we just jump from the text to application, you have robbed yourself of the, the fruit that all of this is going to give to you. Okay? So, so reading a text like Joshua... One, one to nine, I can ask you, you know, you read it, maybe it pops up in your devotional, you read it and you go, okay, you know, just, just as the Lord commanded Joshua to be strong, maybe the Lord is commanding me to be strong. All right, let me pray. Father, help me to be strong, help me to be courageous, and help me to not cut anybody off in traffic today. In Jesus' name I pray, and if somebody does, so help me, Lord. All right, amen, right? And so, and so that's, that's our time with God. Now, if that's the only time you have available in your day, all right. But when we come to studying scripture, we want to make sure we are digging. And when we dig, the application that we will arrive at at the end of the, the interpretive journey will have so much more weight so we talked about God being a covenant-keeping God last week, and we did a quick little study. How many of you felt a difference after that of understanding that God is a covenant-keeping God? Because what? You did the work. You allowed Scripture to inform you. You allowed yourself to encounter God in Scripture so that when you come to a conclusion about God, it has weight to it. This is why Job went through what he went through. Hello? Yeah. Could God not have just appeared to Job and said to Job, Job, you're a righteous man. You're prospering. 
Forget the whole lesson. Forget going through trials and tribulations. Forget losing your crops and your riches. Let me just tell you what I want to tell you about myself. I'm a God who created the foundations. I'm the reason this whole universe works the way it works and animals work in their in, uh, in, in intuitive design as they work. I'm behind the whole thing. And Job could go, wow, that's incredible, amazing. Praise God. But no, God allowed Job to go through some things. God allowed Job to go through a journey so that when he came to the conclusion, he could say the words, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. There's weight because of the journey. And so when we study scripture, we got to go through this interpretive journey so that the conclusion, when we get to it, the application, the contemporary significance, it has weight to it. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's do this with Joshua. What would you say was the original meaning? This is where you get to talk back to me. Say that again. To follow God's, Joshua was to follow God's word. How many would agree with that? Would anyone add anything to that? The word was to be in his mouth to speak it. Yes, meditate on my word day and night. Yes. Right, and so now we're cross-referencing here. We're, we're moving forward in the lesson. But anything else in the original meaning? Okay, make sure he understands. All right, okay, so let's go to the original meaning. The original meaning of the text, remember this text has an, has an author and it has an audience. So what is the author intending to communicate to the audience he is originally writing to? Based on the text, here's what we can dissect. It's not complete, but here's what we can dissect. God appoints Joshua as the new leader. How many agree with that? Moses, my servant, is dead. And he commands Joshua, commanding Joshua to draw strength and courage from his presence. Didn't God say to Joshua, for just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. So he commands Joshua to draw strength and courage from his presence and to be obedient to the law and to me uh, meditate on the law so that he would be successful to get to the promised land. How many would agree that that's a fair summary of the original meaning? Beautiful. Now, what's next? The contemporary, or no, contemporary is not next. What's next? Contextual setting and the gaps and the differences. Now, here's the contextual gaps. How many know we're not leaders of Israel? Hello? In case you are, let me know. <laughs> we're not journeying by foot to a promised land. And we're not under the covenant of the law. So the law that, that he is supposed to abide by, the law that he is supposed to meditate on is the, is the law of the old covenant. Can we clarify that? We're not under that same law. Hello? Right? That's what Romans was about. So there's contextual gaps. We're not leaders of Israel. We're not journeying by foot to a promised land. Um, and we're not under the old covenant. So if there's a gap, what could possibly be the theological principle or principles that we can extract from here that will allow us to build a bridge over the gap? Well, serving God effectively in what he has called you to requires strength and courage that we receive from his presence. God's people are to be obedient to his word, meditating on it constantly. How many would say that that principle is a timeless truth? That no matter what setting you find yourself in, what time and space you find yourself in, whatever culture you find yourself in, or country you find yourself in, serving God effectively requires you to have strength and courage that we receive from his presence. And as God's people, we're to be obedient to his word, meditating on it constantly. Okay? Now, how does this principle 
go up against the rest of the Bible. Now, if you do a quick glance of the study of the Bible, you would find that the Bible affirms the idea that God's people can draw from his strength. And the New Testament shows us that the presence of the Holy Spirit gives believers strength and courage. Right? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Right? You will receive power. And so both the Old Testament and the New Testament exhort people to obey the words of God. Even Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, my word. And so that's how the principle relates against the rest of the Bible. And so we know this principle is good. It is sound and scripture agrees with it. And God is willing to back it up. Now, next is the contemporary significance. How do I now apply this to my life? Well, if I need to draw strength from God, I need to know God. If I need to obey God's word, I need to know his word. So, right away, I can come to the conclusion that I need to be spending time meditating on God's word. Now, I can do this in various ways. This could be my reading of the Bible. This could be audio Bibles. You know that you can listen to the Bible, right? If you download the YouVersion Bible app, it has a little speaker icon. You press it, and all of a sudden, you can hear the scripture now as you're driving, as you're doing stuff. It's another way to spend time meditating on God's word. And then there are other, wor- other ways you can meditate on God's word. If there, for instance, is a scripture you're trying to memorize, you write it down on a little thing, or you have it, you know, maybe as the, the wallpaper of, of your phone for like a couple weeks, so you're memorizing it, you see it every time you open your... These are just many different ways you can spend time meditating on God's word. Now, if God is calling you to something, point number two there, something new, let his presence strengthen you and give you courage. Be reminded that God will never leave me nor forsake me. That is the same thing, right? That Jesus says to his disciples, I will be with you until the end of this age. And so I can draw my strength and my courage from that. And then the other application is I got to be obedient. And in my obedience, the best thing I can do is focus on God. You see that? You see how we went from the, the contextual setting of the text, now all the way to the contemporary significance for today. And we didn't do it by cheating. We didn't do it by, all right, what does this mean to me? No, 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 we, we, we dug, we studied. And now when we apply something like this, we have the confidence to know this is actually God's word interpreted correctly. Amen? It's good? We're doing okay? All right. Let me drink some water and then we'll continue. All right. Now, I want to talk to you about some practical things to, to look for. And so now we're going a little bit deeper and um, we're going to talk about what do we look for if we have, you know, time on our hands to study scripture. We've got a passage in front of us. What are the things, as I study the scripture, beyond just um, the stuff we talked about in the interpretive journey, beyond original meaning, um, the gaps between that context and our context today, the theological principle, the principle versus the Bible, um, how we can apply that today. And so beyond that, what do I look for even as I read sentences? as I read different paragraphs of the Bible. So we're going to get a little bit into the language now and talk about what do we look for beyond just the interpretive journey. I want to do a little bit deeper of a study and I want to go beyond just, okay, here's what it meant for that day. Here's the gaps. Here's the theological principle. Here's what I can apply. I want to actually study the words. I want to study the word. I want to study how Paul perhaps put this sentence or paragraph together and the things that he, that he decides to include and the things that he doesn't decide to include. I want to get a little bit deeper into that. And so here's what to look for as you do that. Um, obviously, there can be more things you can look for, but, but here's a quick list of what is good to look for. Uh, repetition of words. 
How many know if God says some things multiple times, they're probably important? Right? Um, you do that with your kids. How many times do I have to tell you? Right? What are you indicating? That my repetition is an indication of the importance of what I'm telling you. So repetition of words is important. Contrasts. We, we look for contrast where, and I'm going give to you, give you examples of all this, and so, and so don't, don't be too overwhelmed. We're going to go through all of this. I'm going to try to be a good teacher so that you can be good students. Amen? All right. And I'm not going to give you homework because you're not going to do it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, we're going to look for contrast. We're, we're, we're the writers of the text contrast things. Comparison. Where they compare Different ideas, different thoughts, different words, um, lists. There's lists in the Bible, and so you want to look at um, why is there a list? Is there importance to the order of the list? Right? That's all incredibly important as you look at lists. You want to look at cause and effect. Right? Scripture has cause and effect. Do this, then this will happen. Um, figure of speech. You want to look for figure of speech. In, in, the, in the day of Paul's writing, and even in the day of, of Jesus' preaching, hyperbolic language was a form of grabbing the attention of your audience. So when Jesus says to his audience in the Sermon of the Mount, right, that, that if you lust, that you should pluck out your eye. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. How many know that's the figure of speech? to grab your attention and to indicate the importance of what he is trying to communicate, right? And so, figure of speech. Conjunctions, these are incredibly important. These are words like therefore, then, and, but, if so, right? These words are incredibly important because they connect things. Um, verbs, obviously, because they are action words, these are important, and then pronouns um, are incredibly important. So let's go through a couple different examples. All right, can you see this? 1 John 2, 15 to 9. This is, let's, let's go over this, repetition. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, uh, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, there's a list there as well, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of the Father lives forever. Do you see repetition there? What do you see? World. Right, you see the repetition of the word world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of the Father lives forever. So you see the repetition. Indicating it's important. I want Jesus to say, or, or the writer of John, um, the writer John is, is saying to the audience, I want you to pay attention to this contrast and the, the way he wants us or the, the, the tool that he's using us to focus between the contrast of the world and the will of the Father is by repeating the word world. Do not love the world or anything in the world for anyone who loves the world. You see that? Repetition. And so, you, and so as you're reading, you, you look for repetition and you go, okay, this, this might be important if he's going to say it six times yeah. in you know, two sentences, it might be important for me to, to pay attention. And so, and so you make note of that as you're doing your Bible study. You highlight that. Or if you're journaling, which I encourage journaling with scripture reading because it's, it allows you to go back and look at what you discovered, what you want to pray about, what you, what you want to pray through. So journaling alongside Bible study, incredibly fruitful. So you write that down. Maybe you want to do, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this towards the end, maybe you want to do a word study now in the New Testament of the concept of the world, and you want to know what else, what did Jesus, now this is John writing in 1 John, but you, maybe you want to know what did Jesus say in the Gospels about the world? Did he say anything about the world? And you'll find out Jesus and even the, the New Testament writers, they will use sometimes synonymously the, the, the language of the world and the language of this age. Yeah. 
And, and that should give us an indication of how the New Testament authors saw this world. They saw it as something temporary because Jesus talks about a coming age. So if they use um, this age synonymous with this world, how many know that the age to come is better than the age we're in? So that's how they saw the world. And so repetition is incredibly important. Let's move on. Contrast. Okay, do you see contrast here? Whoever oppresses the poor shows, shows uh, contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Do you see contrast? Yes. What is the contrast between those who oppress the poor and those who are kind to the needy? Right? And we can see there's a hint here with this word, but. Signaling there's a contrast. Those who oppress the poor show, there, and there's another contrast here between the result of it, and that is those who oppress the poor show contempt for their maker, who is God, and those who are kind to the needy honor God. So there's even a contrast in the result of the behavior. Right? So he's not just contrasting those who oppress the poor and those who are kind. He's also contrasting those who show contempt toward God versus those who honor God. Contrast. You see that? And so you make note of that. You write that down. You look for that in the text. Now, there's also comparison. Someone say comparison. All right. Like, like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give away who give way to the wicked. Do you see the comparison? What's the comparison? Muddied spring and a polluted well with those who give way to the wicked. How many would say a muddied spring and a polluted well is not a good thing? And so he's comparing, he's drawing a comparison. They are, notice this word right here, like. Like a muddy spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. Are you seeing that? Are you doing okay so far? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then there's lists in scripture. Galatians 5, uh, 22 to 23 um, probably one of the most famous lists in the New Testament. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you look for that, you go, wow, there's a list here. It's not just one thing. Now, what's important about this list even, and, and this is just a sidebar, but you, do you notice that there's multiple things in the list? Hello? Hello? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But the word fruit is singular. You see that? Right? This is just a sidebar. But this means that these are not individual fruits. The fruit. Is this. Okay? It's collective. It's not you're focusing on the fruit of love and neglecting the fruit of peace. Or you're focusing on the fruit of, fruit of joy and you want to be happy, you want to be joyful, but you neglect the fruit of kindness. Well, who cares about anybody else? Isn't, they're not fruits. It's the fruit. Okay. And then there's cause and effect. You see that here. What's the cause? Sin is the cause. What's the effect? Death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so there's cause and effect, even in scripture. That the effect, death, has a cause, and the cause is sin. Right? It goes back to Genesis, where, where God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat of that fruit. Or he said to Adam, don't eat of that fruit, for you will surely die cause and effect. Pardon me? Um, but, but the gift of God is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, yeah, you could, you could put a cause and effect 
um, effect there. Um, where you could go, where you could then go, the gift of God it could, be the, the, could be the effect and the cause could be then those who are in Christ, right? Um, you could, yeah, you could, you could draw that conclusion there as well. All right, figure of speech, right? I should have done the eye plucking one here, but um, Psalms 119, uh, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. Now, how many know that, that if it's dark outside that, and there's no street lights on, all right? Now, hear me out. And you take this, the Bible, and you go outside. How many know your literal path is not going to be illuminated? Hello? Like you can't take the Bible into, into the woods and go, oh, don't worry, I've got a lamp. That's not, and I'm, please, please hear my heart. I'm not trying to be, you know, um, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, create a mockery here, but, but I'm trying to make a point. The point is, he's speaking figuratively, not literally, because he wants to make a point. Just like a lamp, provides light to my path. Your word does that for my life. You see that? And so the, the biblical authors will use figure of speech to get your attention and to allow you to understand the point they're making in a greater way. Right? If I could just, you know, if I said, for instance, if he was to say, well, the, the, word will, the word will show you how to live life. That's one way to say it. But then to, to add a figure of speech to it is what he chose to do, which is to say, your word, like how does the word of God provide direction in, in life? Just like lights. Imagine a world without lights. Chaos. And so too, the life of an individual without the word of God. That's the power of figure of speech. Um, what else do we have? Conjunctions. Okay. Um, for the spirit of God gave us, oh, for the spirit of God gave us, for the spirit God gave us, let me read that, slow down a little. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, conjunctions are words like for. For, because, in other words, the spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord Jesus of of me. Rather, join with me in, in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Conjunctions, they, they connect thoughts and ideas, what has gone before with what is coming after. You see that? So, so important that we get that. And then there's verbs. These are your action words, right? Um, now, in, in, our, in, our, in our verbs, we have two types of verbs. Someone say two types. I just get you to say things so I have time to drink my water. <laughs> and you're like, I've caught on. Okay, uh, two types of verbs. There are active verbs and there are passive verbs. Active verbs are the verbs that the subject is doing. Passive verbs are verbs that are happening to the subject. Now, let me give you an example, take you back to English class, all right? Um, An active verb would be, and Billy threw the ball, right? Billy threw the ball. He's doing the act, right? Or Billy caught the ball. He's doing the act, right? Now, what's, what would be the passive? Billy was, or the ball hit Billy, was a better one. The ball hit 
Billy, what's the verb? Hit. The ball hit Billy. How many know it's passive? Billy didn't do that to himself. Right? And then the active would be Billy hit the ball. The subject is doing the action. That's active. Passive is where the action is being done to the subject. Now, most common passive verbs, not all, but most in the Bible are things God does on behalf of us. We are made righteous. Who does that? Not us. God. Okay, now let's look at this. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined. Do you see a verb? We were predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And so we were chosen. Who did the act of choosing? God. Who was the recipient of the action? We are. Okay, verbs. Incredibly important. And then pronouns, right? Uh, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so pronouns are incredibly important because it's not just, it's not just praise be to the God and the Father of the Lord. It's of our Lord. He's, he's defining whose Lord it is. Okay, we got to move. Um, and so again, to recap, we look for repetition of words, contrast, um, comparisons, uh, cause and effect, figure of speech, conjunctions, verbs, pronouns, um, and all sorts of things. So let's do that real quick um, tonight. All right. Romans 12, 1 to 2. You see it? Yes? All right. (laughs) Okay. So right here, right off the bat, Luigi, let's, pl- let's throw that list up there. There it is. Okay, so we're looking for repetition of words and the rest. Now, let's go for repetition of words. Do you see any repetition of words here? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, yeah, beautiful. We see will. That's repeated, that's repeated twice. Then we also see, don't we see God? God is repeated three times. We even see this word pleasing repeated twice. Anything else? Yep. Right. Now, so now this will is a different will, right? This is you will, not, not your will, right? <laughs> right. Good. Now, if we go here, how many know this is a conjunction? Therefore. Right? This, this connects back to whatever has gone before. Therefore, I, who's the I? Paul. Now, look what he says. I urge you. How many, say, how many would say this is a, a, a strong verb? I urge you. Who are the you? Well, the you are the brothers and sisters. Right? And this idea of, of them continues. So look at what he says. The you are the brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy. Now, we could probably say um, this idea of in view of, this also might connect back to something. In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, that's interesting because there's irony there. It's a sacrifice, but it's living. You see that? Now, this idea of offering your bodies, is he saying literally offer your bodies? Yes or no? Okay, the correct answer is no, okay? So this is a figure of speech. The idea of living sacrifices, also a figure of speech. Holy and pleasing 
to God. And so we said this, oh, where'd I go? This, this idea of pleasing connects to this. Now notice our sacrifice is pleasing to God and God's will is pleasing to us. Right? right? This is your, let me change the color here. This is your true and proper worship. And we go back to your bodies. And so this idea of the brothers and sisters, right? You continues here and then it continues here, right? True and proper worship. So true and proper define worship. It's a worship that's true and proper. Now I would add, I wonder, the question I would ask there even is, does the order matter? True and proper, I wonder. Do not conform, right? That's a negative imperative. An imperative is just a command to do something, and this is in the negative. Do not conform to notice the pattern of this world. Do we have a contrast coming up? Yes, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have another conjunction coming up, which is this word, then, So then speaks to the cause, or sorry, then speaks to the effect. What's the effect? You will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So if if testing and approving is the effect, then what is the cause? Well, the cause would be being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see that? Now, this, this idea here is interesting as well because the, the imperative command um, in the negative here, do not conform, this is something you're doing. But then it says be transformed. Be transformed. Now, this is a verb, but it's passive. Meaning you're not doing the transforming. Isn't that fascinating? Well, then who is and what is? Well, we continue by the renewing of your mind. So it's the renewing of your mind that leads to transformation. So, so the, the, the verb for us to do is not be transformed. It's not, so, so you, you, it's not, hey, everyone here, go be transformed. No, that's passive. It's happening to you. And how is it happening to you? By the renewing of your mind. And as you renew your mind, you're able to test and approve what God's will is. And that leads to the transformation. You see that? Are we doing okay? Okay. We can, we can go on. There's even a list here. We, you can say there might be a list between this idea of God's will being good, pleasing, and perfect. All right? But, um, okay. Let me, let me continue. Um, we got a couple minutes. Um, are you good for time? Because I am. I, I'm, I'm here all night. I'm just kidding. Um, because it's the last session, I do just want to get through these things. Uh, I want to give you, so that's, those are things that you got to look for in sentences, paragraphs. They will definitely help you in your Bible study. Um, so that's, that's one way to do it. The uh, interpretive journey, incredibly helpful to make sure that we're not misinterpreting the word of God, that, that what the original audience thought of the text isn't different than what we think of the text. Hello? So it can't mean something to us that it did not mean to them. You see that? Okay? All right, good. Then there is this method, which is a condensed kind of method or, or version of the interpretive journey. And this is the, uh, uh, the OIA, which is um, observation, interpretation, and application method. This is where you, it's, you do the same thing as the interpretation method, the interpretation journey, you're only condensing it. So you observe, that's where you ask the questions, um, you know, uh, what does, or, or what do I see? So even in Joshua, what do we see? We see Joshua becoming a new leader. We see God commanding Joshua. So, so in the observation, we ask the question, what do I see? Interpretation, what does this mean? This means Joshua can, can, can gather strength and courage from the presence of God. The people of God can gather strength and courage from the people of God. That in, in, in our journey as we follow God's call over our lives, that these things are important. Application. Well, I need to do the very same thing. Just as Joshua was 
uh, told to, to obey and, and, and listen to the word of God. I need to do that same thing. So observation, interpretation, application. So you see how it's the interpretive journey, but it's condensed. Yes. Please speak so I know that I'm doing an okay job. All right, good. Um, the next thing, oh, here we go. There it is, in case you want to take a picture or anything like that. Observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Application, how do I need to change? Scripture should change us, okay? Um, The next thing, and uh, I'll let you take a picture of that, but the next thing I want to talk to you about, yes, (laughs) yes, it's it's up on YouTube, and so you can definitely check it out there. Uh, The next thing I want to talk to you about is what I have coined the character method, okay? Um, and I've really just combined different ways of doing this, and, and, and this has really been beneficial in my reading of the scripture. This is another thing you can do in your time with studying scripture, reading the Bible, okay? It's called the character nature method. I'm saying it's called, but really I've chosen to call it this, all right? Um, character nature method. And these are, and, I've, and I think I've shared this with you guys before, and they're very helpful questions. There's three questions, Okay? The first question is, what does this reveal to me about the character of God? Okay? Number two, what does this reveal to me about the nature of humanity? And number three, how does this change my reality? How does this change my nature? How does it change, excuse me, my character? And and notice I'm not asking the question, well, what do I go do? That's why it's called the character method. We're getting to the character of God, the character of humanity, and how this should change my reality, my character. Why is that important? Because behavior does not inform character. Character informs behavior. You can say amen there. And so that's why it's incredibly important. You don't read the, you don't read the Bible, and we don't teach other people to read the Bible to go read it and then go do something. No, you haven't been changed if that's how you approach the Bible. Make sense? The character of God, the nature of humanity, how does this change my reality? Let's do a quick, quick study of this, okay? This is, this is Jesus talking in Matthew 6. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the street to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. All right, what's the first question of the character method? What does it tell me about the character of God? What does this text teach me about the character of God? What insight is Jesus giving us into the character of God? God's a rewarder. Yes, he will reward you. Also, God is all-knowing. Right? He sees what is done in secret. God also, right? There's other scriptures that talk about this regarding resisting the proud and the arrogant, those who exalt themselves, right? That's what these hypocrites are doing. They're going in the street to be honored by others. And so God's in, in, within God's nature, there is this genuineness, genuine resistance towards the arrogant, the proud, the self-promoting. All right, that, that should be good for what we learn about the character of God. What do we learn about the nature of humanity, the character of humanity? Humanity loves self-promotion. Humanity loves hearing good things things about them by others. When somebody compliments you, not that compliments are wrong, but it feels good. Humanity loves that. Humanity has this appetite, right? To be lifted high, to be honored, to be exalted. Well, then how does this change my reality? How should my nature and my character change now in light of the truth of God's character and what humanity is naturally bent toward? You see how I'm not attacking behavior. I'm not saying now go do things in secret. No. 
my, my prayer then, the application then of how this changes my reality is I want God to see my selfish, self-promoting heart and I want him to attack that. I want the spirit of God to go against every ache and appetite of my flesh that, that wishes to exalt itself, that wishes to be seen as something by other people. God, change that about me. You see that? And watch as your nature changes under the observation and the reality of God's nature, your behavior too will change. It will change your reality. Okay, resources. Um, man, are we okay for time? If you gotta go, I bless you, but I do, wanna, I do wanna talk about just practical resources that I wanna give you really quick. If you gotta go, I bless you. God bless, have an incredible sleep and whatever you gotta do at, at home. Now, if you do go, we will judge you um, because that's the kind of people we are and that part of our nature hasn't been changed yet. And so I'm just messing. I'm just messing. Okay, very quick. Let me see if I can share my screen um, and then we'll do this. Okay, the first website I want to tell you about very quickly is called blueletterbible.org. Blueletterbible.org. Okay, if you go to blueletterbible.org, you will see this pop up. And what you will have here are, you can type in verses, words, or topics, and you can search them in any translation. Okay, so for instance, you can type in um, the, 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 the verse John 1.1, 1, 1, right? How many memorized that verse? In the beginning was the word. And so we hit search. Here's what comes up. Now it will give us context as well um, following the rest of John, right? Now let me zoom in for, for you people because um, I want to make sure you see this. What does it say? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, if you hit this button called tools, a few things will pop up. You will see an interlinear Bible, which is the English with the Greek. You will see different Bibles, translations of that. And so if you click that, you can see different translations, compare them. Cross-referencing. And so cross-referencing, remember we talked about the importance of letting scripture interpret scripture? Cross-referencing will simply give you other scriptures that talk about other ideas in this scripture. So look, right at the, right at the top of correlating verses is Genesis 1-1, which says, in the beginning, God, Right? That, that's probably the closest and strongest cross-reference that John wants his audience to make as he writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, right? So, so there's that. Now, when you go to interlinear, here's the beautiful thing here, is you can go into the Greek. You can go into, for instance, the, the idea of the word, right? If you click here, it will take you into the transliteration, the pronunciation, the root words, the different ways it's used and how it's used. Uh, it will take you into a quick outline of the usage in the Bible, right? So there, there's even, you know, the Jehovah's Witness always um, argue against this, this, this verse about, oh, this is not talking about, this is not talking about uh, Jesus being God. But if you read how the biblical um, language of this word is, is used, it, it, can, it can refer to of speech, a, a word uttered by a living voice, comma. It can also embody a conception. Oh, that's interesting. Right? Or an idea. The word became flesh. Conception, conceived. You see that? And so, and then it gives you some other, other outlines of this idea, uh, this um, this word as well. And so that's incredibly, incredibly beneficial. Blue Letter Bible, you can search up uh, words, phrases, different things. So here's what I encourage you to do. If you're reading the Bible, you know how we read through Romans chapter 12? If this, this idea of, you know, the world, do not conform to the world, right? If this, if this you know, popped into your mind, man, I want to do a little a word study on the world, you can type that in. You can see it occurs 871 times in 214 verses, in the ESV, including 185 exact phrases that they're going to show us uh, first. And so it's adding um, the world there, the world. You'll see all of that. Now, what you can do also is it has the option to do an advanced search. And so you can just go into the Old Testament, 
the whole Bible, the New Testament, the Gospels, or the Epistles. If you want to narrow down your search, you can do that. If you want to go, hey, what does Paul say about the world? You can narrow that down to the Pauline Epistles and do that search. Is that helpful? Okay, uh, there's a free Bible, um, um, a free study Bible um, software. It's, it's actually just web-based. There is a mobile app. It's called um, Faith Life Study Bible. And so you can see, I, can, I popped up Romans 12, um, verse two up here, right? Um, and even if we go down a little bit higher, um, we'll see, here's what happens. The, the Bible, the translation will show up here. This is in the ESV. And then their commentary will show up here. Now, they've got a commentary on the word therefore. They say here, indicates a, cre- a key transition in the letter. What follows appears in light of the preceding context of chapters 118 to chapters 1136. So, so it's giving you commentary on what that says. Now, in, in, faith, um, in faith Life Study Bible, you can also have um, access to different maps and, and all sorts of things that they, that they make available uh, to you as well. Um, images and all sorts of things. The other thing I want to show you is a website called biblehub.com. Biblehub.com. Come. And by the way, these are just three resources that I'm showing you. There's, there's a plethora of resources out there that you can use and that you probably have available. Um, you know, you might know things that I might not know, but here are just things that I want to give to you. Now, uh, Bible Hub, you see, I typed in Romans 12, verse 2. We were looking at that. Uh, Do not conform to this, this world, but uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, you can have all these translations you can do the same thing. You can go into the parallel. You can go to different sermons, commentary, all that. If you scroll down, you'll see commentaries. You can read a little bit about it. You can go into um, the, the Greek as well, and you can do you know, some, word, some word studies as well. Now, if you just go to um, their homepage, this is kind of what it looks like, and there's different tools that they've got there, a library, atlas, commentary, concordance, all of that stuff as well. And so, you know, head to this, play around with it, uh, see, what you can, see what you can find. And lastly, let me give you a challenge, okay? This is a challenge for anyone that's watching online or that is here in person, and you say, Pastor Moses, I struggle with reading my Bible consistently. If you are a consistent Bible reader, this is not for you, all right? Congratulations, you're doing well, continue. But if you lack consistency and you're struggling with consistency, here's my challenge for you, Okay? It's a challenge based on time and the time, okay, that I want to give to you for the next five days is what I want you to commit. This is, this is you if you're saying, I struggle with consistently reading my Bible. For the next five days, I want you to spend a total of five minutes in your day reading the Bible. That's it. That's it. Not 15, not 30, not 45, not an hour. If you struggle with consistency for the next five days, take up the challenge to read the Bible for five minutes. You go, Pastor Moses, what am I going to get out of five minutes of reading? If it's a verse, if it's a couple of verses, Read it. And here's what I want you to do, okay? Whatever those five minutes were like, whether if all you read was do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If that's all you read, for the rest of the day, I want you to chew on that. I want you to think on it. I want you to let it soak in your heart and in your mind. The mistake we make is, is we put this pressure of reading a certain amount in the Bible that we do not have the palate to digest and we wonder why we are inconsistent. And so people who don't read their Bible consistently, you'll read them, hear a message like this on the importance of studying your Bible, and you go, man, I gotta start studying my Bible. You know what? Tomorrow, I'm gonna read two chapters. 
And that lasts for a day and a half. Five minutes. And after you do five days, I want you to forget about the time and I want you to concentrate on the principle. What's the principle? I'm going to read until something hits me so that what hits me, I can chew on. Because if you cannot chew on what you've read, it's not going to make a difference. That's what it means to meditate on the, the law. That's what it means to meditate on the word. It's to chew the curd, to chew the fat. Okay? So even the Old Testament scripture, why, why is there this, this continuous, um, um, ongoing cycle of, of rabbis and students and teachers? And Why? Because even in the Old Testament, even in Jesus' day, the Old Testament was, was not something you would read, figure out, and be done with. It's a lifetime's um, worth of reading, chewing, meditating on. And so five minutes for the next five days and eventually forget about the time. It's not about the quantity, it's about the quality, right? Forget about the time after the five days, build consistency, allow yourself to create the palate, the desire for it. And once you get consistent in that, it will grow. And, and minutes will, will turn into to hours and hours, days. And, and before you know it, it will be a lifetime of you meditating on the word. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for these, uh, Lord, two sessions that we got to do uh, focused around how to study your word. God, I pray that we would continue to go deeper in our time with you, in our time with your word. Help us to know that in our time reading your word, that we are to encounter you, the living God. Make our encounters greater. Make our encounters deeper. May we be people, Lord, of the way even as the early church was called. Help us to be people of your word. Help us to be students of your word. And help us to, at the ultimately, help us to know you, the God of the word. I bless your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.